Sup guys, Derek, moreplacemoredates.com. Today we're going to be talking about LGD4033. This is going to be the most comprehensive video on the entire internet about it. Um, the article is already up as well. I posted it actually back in 2016, I believe, and this is just the updated iteration of the video format. And um, it includes all mentionable data from clinical trials, including all preclinical data that's mentionable on animal models as well as the human models. Um, and includes my own anecdotal findings, side effect profile, um, efficacy, etc. You will not find a more comprehensive video of this on the entire internet. I guarantee you that. So let's get into it. LGD4033 is a selective androgen receptor modulator currently being researched for its potential applications in the clinical treatment of muscle wasting osteoporosis and other related conditions. LGD is purported to be the most potent SARM cl currently in clinical trials. Uh, with its data exhibiting the most favorable ratio of anabolic relative to androgenic activity in the body. So what is it exactly? It was originally developed by Ligand Pharmaceuticals and it was licensed afterwards to Viking Therapeutics and that's who currently owns the LGD license and it's now officially named VK5211 under Viking Therapeutics. So LGD is also commonly referred to as some slang terms on the internet like anabolicum and i'm not really sure why because that's actually a brand name for an anabolic androgenic steroid known as quinbolone that was developed by a pharmaceutical company called park davis so that's like totally unrelated lgd as i mentioned is a selective androgen receptor modulator sarm developed to be a potential treatment for a variety of musculoskeletal degenerative diseases the main goal of all sarms essentially boils down to finding the uh, right compound that provides the same therapeutic benefits of testosterone with improved safety tolerability and patient acceptance so far lgd has demonstrated an incredible efficacy profile and the clinical data suggests that it could be a best-in-class small molecule sarm a potential clinical application despite being the endogenous hormone that men naturally produce testosterone use in a clinical setting for treating muscle and bone wasting diseases is extremely limited because of its androgenicity and pharmacokinetic issues. So testosterone is not selective enough for muscle tissue and bone relative to other androgen affected tissues like the prostate. And it's also not orally bioavailable. So, you know, there's obviously uh, treatments that are being developed right now for orally bioavailable versions of testosterone. But still, when it comes down to it, it's inherent androgenicity is extremely very suboptimal doesn't make it a perfect candidate for a wide variety of individuals especially women so this is why a sarm like lgd 4033 is so promising as it's non-steroidal and exhibits a high level of selectivity testosterone exhibits a two to one selectivity for muscle to prostate in men treatment with testosterone and other anabolic androgenic steroids would result in prostate growth stimulation and artificially induce uh, hypogonadism hence why a more selective treatment that can target uh, muscle tissue and bone specifically would be a more desirable alternative obviously in women treatment with testosterone or other anabolic androgenic steroids can lead to the development of male characteristics viralization hence why a more selective treatment that is capable of fulfilling the same functions as of androgens but in a more selective manner in muscle tissue and bone is obviously a desirable alternative. Testosterone induces significant energetic activity at therapeutic dosages, which disqualifies it entirely as an optimal treatment method for muscle and bone wasting diseases. This is why SARMs like LGD may prove to be safer and more effective alternatives. The ideal anabolic agent should demonstrate anabolic activity in muscle and bone without suppressing luteinizing hormone, not negatively interacting with other steroid receptors in the body, um, exhibiting a high level of bioavailability at the same time without the need for methylation and avoid 5-alpha reduction to DHT or aromatization into estrogen. SARMs were first discovered in 1998, following which several uh, different compounds were developed by a variety of pharmaceutical companies in order to find a viable compound to satisfy the obvious need in degenerative disease treatment. Mechanism of action. So LGD has a high level of bioavailability, meaning it can be dosed orally as opposed to requiring intramuscular injection, as is the case with most traditional anabolic steroids, and it does not require methylation in order to be absorbed and utilized by the body, as opposed to 
methylated oral anabolic steroids that are intentionally designed to be liver toxic uh, with a methyl or ethyl group at the C17 alpha position. So they're orally bioavailable. SARMs like LGD4033 stimulate androgen receptors in a selective way whereby they induce a greater amount, a significantly greater amount of anabolic activity in the body relative to androgenic activity. LGD binds to the androgen receptor with extremely high affinity, uh, has a KI of approximately 1 nm as a reference point um, that's roughly equivalent to that of testosterone and formidable to that of DHT. And it has the highest known uh, binding affinity of any SARM currently in clinical development. And once it does bind to the androgen receptor, it exerts anabolic effects in muscle tissue and bone. The only SARM I know of that has a formidable binding affinity to LGD4033 is uh, S23, but its efficacy profile and safety profile is less optimal for the purposes of muscle degenerative disease treatment and stuff like that. It's more for male hormonal contraception and stuff, which is another video for another time. Due to the tissue selective mechanism of action and oral route of administration, LGD may be effective at producing all of the therapeutic benefits of testosterone uh, with a vastly improved safety profile. The negative effects that stem from traditionally used testosterone converting to a 5-alpha reduced androgen that can increase the risk of benign prostate hyperplasia, prostate carcinoma, acne breakouts, and substantially expedited male pattern baldness could potentially be averted entirely if uh, LGD became an approved treatment alternative in a clinical setting. LGD could potentially provide a sufficient amount of anabolic stimulation to completely mitigate muscle wasting and bone degradation while simultaneously avoiding the occurrence of androgenic side effects in women entirely. So the lack of androgenicity is favorable for both men and women, but it proves especially useful in the context of treating women as even low dosages of anabolic androgenic steroids would induce viralization. Finding a balance between a therapeutic amount of anabolic activity with a near complete absence of androgenic activity is extremely difficult to integrate into anabolic agent, but the clinical data suggests that LGD may be capable of getting as close as is possible as of science right now. After binding to the androgen receptor, LGD blatantly exhibits the ability to increase muscle mass and strength, and it is also reported to increase bone formation, bone strength, and decrease bone resorption. Aside from Austrian, LGD is the closest SARM to making it through clinical trials and being approved. Uh, right now, it's in phase two for hip fracture and muscle wasting, and uh, I think it's actually going to approve before Austrian, to be honest. Uh, this is the VK... 5211 pipeline for your guys' reference. So getting into the clinical trials and the results. Preclinical, we're gonna start with that, the RAT models. The data revealed a greater than 500 fold selectivity for muscle tissue to prostate in rats. A greater than 500 to one anabolic to androgenic selectivity would make LGD the most selective SARM to date, even more so than BMS-564929, which has a selectivity of 160 to one and may have had its potency in muscle tissue exaggerated in its preclinical findings. In the preclinical studies, castrated rats that were given LGD experience increased muscle size and in a rat model of osteoporosis, the rats in experienced increased bone mineral density. To exhibit tissue selectivity in rats, they were castrated and left untreated for 14 days to provide ample time for muscle and prostate atrophy. And this is how they essentially establish how effective or efficacious a SARM is because they just can assess after those two tissues have atrophied how much stimulation the anabolic agent provides to the tissue and restoring its weight. So the more muscle activity and the less prostate activity, the better. Following which the rats were administered varying dosages of LGD for the next 14 days. The following graph illustrates the data derived from the preclinical studies, which exhibits how much LGD stimulated muscle growth relative to prostate growth in comparison to, to testosterone. So as you can see here, testosterone is not selective whatsoever with only a two to one selectivity, but it should be noted according to Viking, which is the company that currently has the license over VK5211 LGD, they say there's no tissue selectivity of testosterone, which isn't exactly true. It's actually two to one up to a certain point at which time the points sort of intersect. For VK5211 though, it's uh, over 500 to one, at least in this preclinical finding. 
So any anabolic agent will be, you should note every anabolic agent will, as of now, become more androgenic the higher its dose. So even if they're highly selective for muscle tissue to, muscle tissue to prostate to the extent where prostate size cannot or prostate weight cannot be restored to baseline um even with mega doses of SARMs it doesn't mean it's completely lacking androgenicity it's not really the case because any compound any hormone that's androgenic or anabolic in nature is going to have some androgenic activity inherently and um the higher the dosages are pushed the diminishing returns effect starts to set in more and more that's where you know the goal of SARMs is essentially to replicate the therapeutic benefits of testosterone, not to create a super hormone that can dose dependently build muscle with limitless capabilities while simultaneously having zero androgenic side effects at all dosages, as that would be unreasonable and impossible to develop as of science right now anyway. So I think in the future, though, there'll be more potent and more selective SARMs that come out that are, you know, really push the boundaries of uh, human human performance and you know muscle muscle growth anabolic stimulation etc. LGD stacked up against testosterone very well in the preclinical models with a greater than 500 times uh, tissue selectivity of muscle to prostate and in the preclinical rat model of osteoporosis female rats were allowed to develop osteopenia um, for eight weeks before once daily treatment with LGD for 12 weeks. LGD successfully increased lumbar spine bone mineral density as effectively as estradiol and testosterone as you can see on the graph on the left and also significantly decreased trabecular bone turnover compared to placebo which you can see in the graph on the right in the preclinical primate model uh cynomolgus monkeys were orally administered lgd once per day at dosages of 0, 0 0.6, 3, 15, or 75 milligrams per kilogram for 13 weeks. LGD treatment resulted in a dramatic increase in lean muscle tissue compared to the placebo group. The results showed a significant increase in body weight in both the male and female monkeys during the study. Body weight increase was measured in percent gained as seen in the y-axis of the graphs here. After 13 weeks of once per day dosing, there was a significant increase in body weight for all monkeys except for the untreated group. The 75 milligram per kilogram group was stopped after 48 days uh, due to signs of toxicity, but it's not really relevant to Vikings phase two clinical trials because human dosages have not exceeded two milligrams per day in the human trials as of now. That's not to say that it didn't exceed two milligrams in the safety trials though, which we'll get into soon. More than 70% of the mass gain was retained after a four-week recovery period when the weight of the monkeys was checked again, as you can see here, with significant increases observed in both sexes at 0 milligrams per kilogram, 0 0.6, 3, and 15. The preclinical data suggests that LGD is highly selective for muscle tissue and could potentially perform with a much improved therapeutic profile in a clinical setting relative to testosterone. So getting into the phase one trials in humans, Three phase one studies on LGD were successfully accomplished. The phase one trials are the first stage of testing in human subjects designed to assess safety, side effects, best dosage, and formulation method of the drug. The takeaway from all phase one human trials was that LGD exhibits a very encouraging safety profile and tolerability at dosages that would uh, provide significant improvements in lean muscle mass and positive trends in strength and performance measurements. The first phase one trial involving LGD was a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial conducted in 2009 on 48 healthy male volunteers. The volunteers were divided into six cohorts and received an escalating daily dosage of LGD uh, ranging from dosages of 0 0.1 milligrams to 22 milligrams per day. So keep in mind, this is a human trial with 22 milligrams per day. All doses of LGD tested in humans, even the 22 milligram per day dosage, were shown to be uh, safe, well tolerated with predictable pharmacokinetics. The pharmacodynamics showed dose dependent reductions in total serum testosterone levels, SHBG levels, and fasting HDL, which is consistent with the mechanism of action of SARMs and all anabolic agents. The second phase one trial uh, involving LGD was a placebo-controlled study conducted on 76 healthy men ages 
21 to 50 years old. They were randomized to either placebo or 0.1 milligrams or 0.3 milligrams or one milligram of LGD daily for 21 days. Blood counts, chemistries, lipids, prostate specific antigen, electrocardiogram, hormones, lean and fat mass and muscle strength were measured during and for five weeks after intervention. LGD was shown to be safe and well tolerated. There was a dose dependent suppression of to total testosterone, SHBG, HDL cholesterol and triglyceride levels. FSH and free testosterone only showed significant suppression at the one milligram per day dosage. Lean muscle mass increased significantly in a dose dependent manner with minimal changes in fat mass. Hormones and lipid profiles all returned to baseline after treatment discontinuation. There were no drug related serious adverse events, no liver toxicity, no negative effect on electrocardiogram results and no adverse effects on PSA levels. There was a dose proportional increase in drug concentrations on days one and 21, suggesting that accumulation occurs upon multiple dosing, which is very important to note. If someone took the same dose every 24 hours, LGD would eventually accumulate to extremely high levels in the blood, and it would be wiser to assume the half-life is closer to 36 hours based on the clinical data in this study. So if you look at the results here in lean body mass increase, um, LGD increased lean body mass on average 1.21 kilograms, which is 2.67 pounds at the one milligram dosage. The increase in lean body mass was dose dependent and we can assume will increase more as the dosages go up even more above one milligram. So the capability of LGD to increase lean muscle mass in such a short span of time without negatively affecting PSA levels bolds well for its efficacy and safety profile Moving forward, the third phase one trial involving LGD was conducted to evaluate the safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics properties of LGD in elderly subjects. The study is assumed to be the most representative of the hip fracture population, which is the main clinical application Viking seeks approval for with LGD. The end goal is to receive approval to treat patients who have suffered a hip fracture by slowing or preventing the loss of their lean body mass or bone mineral density. LGD had predictable pharmacokinetics similar to those reported in younger male subjects and was shown to be safe and well tolerated at all doses evaluated with no serious adverse events observed. So going into the phase two trials on humans, in phase two, the scope of treatment applications of LGD narrows as there needs to be a specific condition that the SARM is meant to treat in order to receive uh, FDA approval. In this trial, the efficacy and safety profile of LGD in the maintenance or improvement of lean body mass, bone mineral density, and function in patients recovering from non-elective hip fracture surgery is assessed. So hip fracture is associated with a number of morbidities, most of which are a consequence of lean muscle loss and bone degradation following hip fracture surgery. Within the first year after a hip fracture, body fat levels increase by up to 7% on average while lean muscle mass decreases by up to 11%. So typically healthy older females without hip fractures will, would only lose approximately 1% of their lean tissue per year and gain 1.7% body fat. Bone mineral density also severely declines in hip fracture patients. Uh, the negative changes in body composition following a hip fracture are represented in the following graphs. So as you can see here, there's a trend, a very blatant trend downward in lean muscle loss after a hip fracture. And then here you can see a blatant trend downwards of bone mineral density loss after a hip fracture. So the ability to slow or prevent the loss of lean body mass or bone mineral density would likely have a profound impact on patient recovery following hip fracture. So getting into the phase two trial results, the first LGD4033 phase two trial started October 30th, 2015 and completed in March, 2018. Uh, the clinical trial was 12 weeks long and involved 108 patients, 83 women and 25 men who were at least 65 years old and had suffered a hip fracture within the past three to seven weeks. Subjects were administered placebo or 0.5 milligrams, one milligram or two milligrams of LGD once daily for 12 weeks. The primary goal of the trial was to assess 
Changes in lean body mass uh, with secondary and exploratory endpoints, including assessments of patient quality of life, functional status, change in appendicular lean mass, uh, total lean body mass, bone mineral density, and activities of daily living. So as you can see here in the graph with the primary endpoint and secondary endpoints assessed, uh, LGD produced significant increases in lean body mass and appendicular lean mass following 12 weeks of daily dosing in all subjects. A consistent dose response was observed across all primary and secondary efficacy measures. LGD exhibited encouraging safety and tolerability, and there were no drug-related serious adverse events in the study. Okay, so comparing LGD to anabolic androgenic steroids, there haven't been a lot of direct comparisons in a clinical setting. Nandrolone is one of the few anabolic steroids uh, that was approved for human use that uh, continue to display favorable efficacy and safety profile, mainly due to its lack of androgenicity and tissue selectivity. So it's not, you know, inherently like a SARM, but it's more so like one than many of the other androgens that were being prescribed to men, uh, women, even children back in the day that eventually became discontinued because of their, you know, the emergence of data that showed just how androgenic they were and low tolerability in a clinical setting. So nandrolone is one of the most efficacious hormones, you know, still available for this kind of like clinical application of bone and muscle degenerative disease treatment. And in comparison with, um, VK5211, also LGD. LGD significantly outperformed nandrolone milligram for milligram in percent improvement in lean body mass versus baseline. Obviously, take that with a grain of salt, though, because, you know, one milligram of LGD is obviously going to significantly outperform nandrolone. Does that mean nandrolone is a terrible hormone? No. Um, it just means that milligram for milligram, LGD is way more potent. And in the setting in which it would probably be applied probably still has a higher level of selectivity a much higher level of selectivity than nandrolone so it kind of outperforms in all facets for the intended purpose of which it's being designed and something you have to keep in mind too is the diminishing returns effect of anabolic activity with SARMs they're meant to replicate the therapeutic benefits of testosterone up to a certain level it's not meant to be some super hormone that can replace super physiological dosages of androgens. So comparing, you know, like 400 to 600 milligrams of DECA to 10 milligrams of LGD in a clinical setting, it's, it's never going to happen. And it's also kind of a apples to oranges comparison here. Cause like the whole goal, like LGD is probably not even going to be approved up to 10 milligrams. It'll be approved for something like two, two milligrams or something like that, where the therapeutic muscle retention of testosterone can be achieved with a lack of the side effects that would crop up as you increase the androgen index in your body and crank up the dose and start to raise those uh, anabolic androgenic type side effects that occur in the presence of SARMs or anabolic steroids. So how does LGD compare to other SARMs? LGD has a competitive effect on total lean body mass relative to other clinical stage SARMs and is more potent on muscle compared with myostatin targeting approaches. So LGD versus Austrian, while well, Austrian also has an encouraging safety and efficacy profile and is clearly very selective for muscle tissue relative to prostate and other androgen affected tissues. In comparison to LGD, it's weaker in almost all facets. As you can see in the graph below, milligram for milligram, LGD, also known as VK5211, um, outperforms Austrian, also the official name in Nobosarm, with greater increases in lean muscle mass and strength. However, Austrian is less suppressive than LGD, which can be important for recovering baseline hormone levels as quickly as possible after discontinuation. So it has that over LGD, but in pretty much all other factors, LGD is uh, significantly superior to Austrian. So LGD versus S23. S23 is a SARM in preclinical stage right now developed by GTX. Um, which is the same company that made Austrian, which is actually Austrian is just S22 of the S series of SARMs. S23 is the one after Austrian and it's being developed as a potential male hormonal contraceptive binds to the androgen receptor uh, much harder than its predecessors like Andarine S4 um, and Austrian and has an extremely potent effect in muscle with a high level of selectivity. Comparing LGD to S23 head to head, there are many who would argue 
the S23 is the strongest SARM in development right now. And they could be right to some extent. However, it's still in the preclinical stages and it's extremely suppressive. So that's why it's being developed as a potential male contraceptive right now. It's far more suppressive than LGD. And in the preclinical rat model, the S23 was studied. S23 suppressed LH levels by more than 50% after only 14 days with doses as low as 0.1 milligrams per day. There are also reports of aggression with S23, as well as some strange side effects like dehydration and increased body temperature. Based on the data, both clinically and anecdotally, um, it's pretty blatantly obvious that S23 is actually more androgenic uh, milligram for milligram than LGD, and its selectivity is far less selective for anabolic to androgenic activity than LGD, LGD is. So for the clinical outcomes that people are seeking with the development of SARMs, LGD is far more, uh, fits that mold far more than S23. And it's also why S23 is now being developed for male hormonal contraception as opposed to, you know, its predecessor, Austrain, which is still in the development for um, looking at applications for muscle wasting and bone degenerative disease treatment. So while S23 might be, you know, like overall stronger for the purpose of its use, it's actually far inferior inferior to LGD. So for anabolic to androgenic activity, which should be noted, LGD dosage, milligram for milligram, LGD induces substantially more anabolic activity than any other viable SARM alternative and even outperforms many anabolic steroids. Milligram for milligram, it outperforms a lot of them. The first phase one study conducted on LGD established safety and tolerability of LGD up to dosages of 22 milligrams per day in humans. It's very unlikely that 22 milligrams per day will be necessary to replicate the anabolic properties of endogenous amounts of testosterone to prevent the loss of lean muscle or muscle or bone mineral density in hip fracture patients. However, it's obviously useful for us to know that it has established a fairly encouraging safety profile, even at high dosages up to 22 milligrams. LGD produced dose dependent effects on primary and all secondary measures of lean body mass with significant increases in lean body mass and appendicular lean mass following 12 weeks of daily dosing. The highest dosage utilized in phase two clinical trials was two milligrams per day for therapeutic purposes. Side effects. While LGD was generally regarded as safe in human trials using dosages as high as 22 milligrams per day, it doesn't mean it had no negative side effects. There were some negative side effects reported in the clinical data as well as anecdotally among recreational users. So I'm going to get into those now. Decrease good cholesterol, HDL. The clinical data shows dose-dependent suppression of HDL cholesterol and triglyceride levels with LGD usage, a negative effect on HDL levels is consistently noted as a common side effect of all traditional anabolic steroids as well as other SARMs. Despite SARMs ability to be selective about how they exert anabolic activity in the body, they evidently do not differ much from anabolic steroids in regards to their effects on lipid profiles. Testosterone suppression. SARMs have shown to suppress luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone through the HPTA thus decreasing testosterone in a dose-dependent manner. LGD suppresses its SHBG and total testosterone levels in clinical trials in a dose-dependent manner. Serum-free testosterone and FSH levels were only suppressed in the subjects treated with one milligram of LGD. There was no LH suppression in subjects treated with LGD during the 21-day clinical trial conducted on healthy young men. However, the treated groups were only administered either 0.1 milligram 0.3 milligrams or one milligram for three weeks. And those are obviously really low dosages and it's also a very short time frame. Based on the overwhelming supporting data on anabolic agents collected over the past 50 years, I believe it's safe to say that LGD will show blatant reductions in all of these hormone markers in a dose dependent manner. And the dosages in the studies just weren't high enough to consistently yield this data. At higher dosages above one milligram, I'm sure free testosterone levels would drop considerably as the dose was titrated up and other markers would decrease in parallel. Regardless, the degree to which even high dosages of LGD suppress LH and FSH is far less than that of traditional anabolic steroids. The process of recovering baseline 
hormone levels and health markers would be hindered to a far greater extent in anabolic steroid users. Elevated estrogen or decreased estrogen. LGD does not aromatize into estrogen. However, by suppressing natural testosterone levels, it can create an unfavorable balance between testosterone testosterone and estrogen in the body um, by occupying the androgen receptor with such a high affinity lgd can divert a significant amount of testosterone to aromatize into estrogen that wouldn't have otherwise and the consequence of this is a systemic elevation of estrogen levels in the body which is commonly misinterpreted as pro-hormone laced SARMs, which is very very often not the case and what actually happens is the androgen receptors in your body, which are typically occupied by testosterone and DHT, when LGD comes in, which has a binding affinity formidable to that of testosterone, pretty much equal, if not greater than that of testosterone and formidable to that of DHT, it knocks a lot of these androgens off of the receptor in order to occupy it itself, thus resulting in more free floating testosterone, which can then aromatize into estrogen. Common symptoms of high estrogen include acne, oily skin, erectile dysfunction, low libido, lethargy, gynecomastia, irritability, depression, water retention, high blood pressure, enlarged prostate, shrunken testicles, sugar cravings. While LGD can cause estrogen levels to rise via the increased aromatization of circulating endogenous testosterone, long-term use or high dosages of LGD can cause an opposite effect whereby the body has such a low level of circulating testosterone via endocrine suppression that the body no longer has enough aromatization occurring to satisfy estrogen fulfilled physiological functions in the body. The low estrogen levels can lead to a variety of deleterious health outcomes as well. Common symptoms of low estrogen include dull weak orgasms, dry skin and lips, dehydration, erectile dysfunction, low libido, irritability, mood swings, loss of appetite, fatigue, lethargy. Potential applications in alternative hormone replacement therapy in men. So as LGD does not aromatize into estrogen, it would automatically be disqualified as a viable standalone hormone replacement therapy treatment for men. Estrogen serves several important functions in the male body, uh, oftentimes completely overlooked, and those functions rely on a sufficient amount of estrogen being produced via the aromatization of testosterone into estrogen. Low estrogen side effects can be just as deleterious as high estrogen side effects in men. In a hypothetical scenario where LGD would be considered as a potential long-term HRT treatment, it would very likely need to be used in conjunction with exogenous estradiol to maintain healthy blood serum concentrations that would have otherwise been achieved via adequate testosterone to estrogen aromatization. Androgenic activity. LGD exhibits a dose-dependent increase in androgenic activity in the body. While it's extremely selective for muscle tissue and bone relative to androgen-affected tissues, all SARMs, LGD included, result in systemic increases in androgen activity. Therefore, there will still be some potential for androgenic side effects. Granted, the extent to which this occurs is just far less. So LGD has on paper, an anabolic to androgenic ratio of greater than 500 to 1. That's in rats, though. In humans, I feel like it's less than that, but it's still highly, highly selective. And it's purported to still have a 500 to 1 selectivity in humans via Viking's own statements. So I'm not going to argue that. I'm just saying. Anyways, the therapeutic dose necessary to yield the desired level of muscle and bone mineral density retention in hip fracture patients will very likely not be high enough where any notable androgenic activity would occur. And in a performance enhancement context, very high dosages would very likely result in some level of androgenic activity just due to the sheer dosage being uh, deployed. Hair loss. All androgens can cause hair follicle miniaturization. The extent to which they do this is dependent on their individual selectivity though, binding affinity, and the dosage used. In general, LGD should not cause any notable androgenic alopecia. However, this does not exclude temporary shedding, also known as acute telogen effluvium, which can be triggered by a hormone fluctuation. So any substantial shift in men's hormone profile can cause hair roots to be pushed prematurely into the resting phase. Any hormone fluctuation, stressor, autoimmune response, deficiency or chemical imbalance can potentially result in a temporary shed and this is not to be confused with androgenic alopecia which is permanent hair loss well not 
not completely permanent, but anyways, like what's seen to be the traditional form of miniaturized hair follicles caused by androgen induced follicular miniaturization. So LGD, the dose which would, you know, cause androgenic alopecia could be whatever level is higher than your current endogenous androgen index induced by your circulating amount of testosterone and DHT. But there's also probably on the opposite side of the spectrum, a dosage of LGD, which is going to result in less androgenic activity in the body due to the suppression of testosterone and DHT through the HPTA, as well as knocking those more androgenic hormones off of the androgen receptor sites. So it kind of can go both ways, depending on the dosage deployed of LGD. Liver toxicity. LGD did not result in any significant changes in AST or ALT levels in human trials. However, it should be noted that in a relevant clinical trial conducted on Austrian, which is a SARM with an identical mechanism of action, short-lived increases in ALT to above the upper limit of normal were observed in eight subjects. Taking this into consideration, it's entirely possible that LGD could potentially also exhibit some degree of liver toxicity at dosages higher than the one milligram trial where they assess those health markers. At therapeutic dosages, there appears to be a strong safety profile and the data suggests a complete absence of liver toxicity. But at the dosages being deployed for performance enhancing use, it's very, very possible that there could be dose dependent increases in ASC and ALT, which again could be a reason why um, SARMs are often misinterpreted as pro-hormone laced, whatever, based on blood work. Lack of aromatization and 5-alpha reduction. So SARMs are resistant to metabolism by 5-alpha reductase and aromatase. The most potent androgen in the prostate is DHT, which is formed by 5-alpha reduction of testosterone. 5-alpha reductase is expressed in high levels in the prostate and very low levels in muscle tissue. A study that assessed how much of a role endogenous DHT plays when it comes to building muscle discovered that it literally does nothing for gains in lean muscle mass and that the conversion of testosterone to DHT is not essential for mediating its anabolic effects on muscle. So this is completely contrary to what many people would assume as DHT is such a potent androgen. However, the fact that DHT is expressed in high levels in the prostate, but at low levels in muscle and bone coupled with the data from that study exhibits the true significance of DHT in prostate and testosterone in muscle and bone. LGD does not undergo 5-alpha reduction, which is speculated to contribute to its sparing effect on prostate and other androgen affected tissues. This is not the case though, and this is my own interjection here with my own opinion completely contradicting their study findings or their, you know, their educated guess is that there are several androgens that do not undergo conversion to a more androgenic compound when undergoing 5-alpha reduction. And one of the most notable being uh, trestolone, also known as mint, and I've done a whole video on this as well. Some androgens exhibit higher levels of androgenicity prior to 5-alpha reduction and actually cause more androgenic side effects in the body when they are inhibited by 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And a prime example of this is the anabolic androgenic steroid nandrolone. As you can see in the graph here, different patterns of metabolism determine the relative anabolic activity of 19 nor androgens. Testosterone, it actually is uh, when 5-alpha reduction is inhibited by finasteride or dutasteride, the uh, ventral prostate stimulation goes way down because there's way less andro androgenic activity occurring due to a inhibited 5-alpha reduction to DHT, so less DHT present as a result of the inhibitor. However, when you inhibit the 5-alpha reduction of nandrolone into dihydronandrolone, what you're doing is you're actually preventing nandrolone from 5-alpha reducing into a less androgenic metabolite. So the side effect of this is there's more circulating nandrolone in the body, which is far more androgenic than the less androgenic metabolite DHN. So by inhibiting 5-alpha reduction of nandrolone, you're actually making it far more androgenic by preventing it from reducing into the much less potent DHN. And then as you see with trestolone, ment, um, there's almost no difference whatsoever by inhibiting 5-alpha reductase for that because it doesn't have a more uh, androgenic metabolite or more or less androgenic than the parent hormone trestolone. So LGD is inherently selective for the androgen receptor and its selectivity for muscle tissue and bone relative to prostate is not a result of its inability to be altered by 5-alpha reductase. 
And finally, the half-life of LGD. LGD displayed a prolonged elimination half-life of 24 to 36 hours. Linear pharmacokinetics and predictable accumulation with multiple dosing. There was a dose proportional increase in LGD4033 concentrations on days 1 and 21 because of its long half-life. Despite being reported to have a half-life of 24 to 36 hours, it would be wise for users to err on the side of caution and take into consideration that serum concentrations were nearly threefold higher on day 21 than on day one in the second phase one clinical trial. This means that once daily dosing will result in concentration buildup of the compound over time, as 24 hours is not enough clearance time to assume that once daily dosing will equate to stable blood serum concentration levels in the body. All right, that is the comprehensive overview of LGD4033. Thank you guys for watching. Please uh, like, drop a comment, subscribe. Check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Check me out on Instagram, at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, etc. Check out uh, my affiliate links for any companies I'm affiliated with in the video description below if you want to support the channel, as well as if you happen to be on the iTunes store and you're listening to this in post podcast form, or you want to go check out the podcast, please drop a five-star rating. That would be very much appreciated and it would help out the growth of the channel. So thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.